Charles Adams was born in um, Westfield, New Jersey on January 7th, 1912. Uh, only child of a, a father who was a piano salesman and on the road a lot. And he had a mother and an aunt who basically took care of him most of the time and he did a lot of drawing with them. In Westfield, New Jersey, it was a there were dilapidated homes, big old Victorian empty houses, and uh, or at least in state of detritus to a point. And he was fascinated by that. Um, he also walked to school past these houses. He didn't happen to live in a home like that, but he did pass by them. But he also uh, was fascinated very early on with cemeteries, loved cemeteries. Um, he and his wife, in fact, here, loved cemeteries and would picnic in them often. It was a quiet, restful place to be. But as a child, he was interested more in what's, what were those people all about underneath the ground and would stand and think about it um, and look at their headstones too. I think that was part of the interest and the intrigue is what was written on headstones. He has a lot of drawings. Uh, of cemeteries and and the headstones are always revealing mostly are revealing for what the the gag line is about the drawing he did try college he tr went to uh, Colgate University University of Pennsylvania uh, in Philadelphia and um, Grand Central School for Artists never graduated from any of them but he attended and clearly he was destined to do what he was going to do. Basically, I think he had a few jobs that, that laid the foundation, but his heart was always waiting to get to The New Yorker. The first real full drawing that was published by The New Yorker in 1933 was of uh, a hockey player and two hockey players standing there and looking at the third hockey player who has a remorse on his face and is hung kind of hang dog with his, when you look down, he's wearing his stocking feet, his socks, and his toes are crossed in front of him, and he said, I forgot my skates. You know, and, and it's a wonderful, really wonderful drawing. It's a line drawing, which um, I think most people don't know that work of Charlie's because he did develop fairly soon after the first few years of starting to build up more than just a line drawing. The Adams Family characters were never drawn as a family. They just started out as different characters that he drew. Um, the very first Adams Family is really Morticia and Gomez, um, August 6, 1938. That is the date it was published in The New Yorker. And it's a salesman coming to the door and is trying to sell them a vacuum cleaner. What's interesting about it is that this is the beginning of seeing what did become the Adams family. A few, a few drawings to eventually pull them together, that there is a, a, a father and a mother and, a, and two children and some other characters, other aunts and uncles and grandma and ma. But they didn't form right away. They became referred to in the news media that it was Adams's family of ghouls. But that's how the Adams family really became the Adams family. It's an interesting story of how the Adams family even happened. Uh, unfortunately, David Levy is no longer alive, but he was a producer and was in Manhattan, passed a double day bookstore window and saw one of Charlie's books in the window. And it happened to have the quote unquote family, who had not yet been a family, but were a family of characters. And he said to whomever he was with, we should, that should become a television program. Um, he contacted Charlie uh, through the New Yorker. They met for drinks at the Plaza Hotel, I believe. And the rest is history. Eventually, these characters had to be named. They had not been named. They never appear in, um, any of the books, any of the, any of the um, caption lines do not have any names on them. So Charlie did name them. 
Charlie actually wrote this. This is attached to the contract that Filmways has, is his little sketches of Morticia or Gomez or whatever family member and their characterizations. Uh, uh, Morticia is the head of the family, the driving force behind the family. Uh, Low-voiced, incisive, and subtle, smiles are rare. This ruined beauty has a romantic side, too, and is given to low-keyed rhapsodies about her garden of deadly nightshade, henbane, and dwarf's hair. Moving along to Wednesday. She is a solemn child, prim in dress, and on the whole, pretty lost. Secretive and imaginative, poetic, seems underprivileged and given to occasional tantrums, has six toes on one foot. The boy, Pugsley, it may be interesting to know that in the very beginning, Pugsley had several names, uh, one of which was um, Pubert. Uh, and it was determined at that time that Pubert was not going to be acceptable to 1963 television whatsoever, and he became Pugsley. An energetic monster of a boy, about nine years old, blonde red hair, popped blue eyes, and a dedicated troublemaker. In other words, the kid next door. A genius in his own way, he makes toy guillotines, full-size racks, threatened to poison his sister, can turn himself into a Mr. Hyde with an ordinary chemical set. Granny Frump, who Charlie did name Granny Frump, becomes Grandmama. The complexion is dark, the hair is white and frizzy and uncombed. She has a light beard and a large mole. She wears a shawl on all occasions, thick socks and fleece slippers under a bombazine skirt. Uncle Fester, who Charlie did seem to feel was most like his own personality. Uncle Fester is incorrigible, and except for the good nature of the family and the ignorance of the police, would ordinarily be under lock and key. The complexion, like Morticia's, is dead white. The eyes are pig-like and deeply embedded circled unhealthily in black, no teeth and absolutely hairless. Lurch the butler. This towering mute has been shambling around the house forever. He is not a very good butler, but a faithful one. He is often sent to pick the awful herbs from the garden, for instance, but will often forget the most important ingredient of all, say, I of newt. We'll move to Thing, which is interesting also because Thing is, you will see, is a different character than what became thing as we know it today. The, th the thing is often observed watching the family through the balustrades of the balcony over the living room. We don't quite know who or what he is, but whatever, he's the soul of good nature. At least he grins perpetually and may occasionally whimper. And last but not least is Gomez. Gomez, husband of Morticia, if indeed they are married at all, a crafty schemer, but also a jolly man in his own way. He is dressed in a tight, double-breasted striped suit and is sometimes seen in a rather formal dressing gown. The only one who smokes, though Pugsley can be allowed an occasional cigar. The house is a wreck, of course, but this is a house-proud family, just the same, and every trapdoor is in good repair. Money is no problem, they are quite well off. Some ancestor made a real killing. All of this in Charlie's words. It's interesting how the press perceives and builds up a character versus how the possible character is. Um, Charles Adams is a perfect example of that. His drawings would lead one to believe that there was a someone who should be incarcerated or drew from incarceration, possibly in a madhouse. Um, he was accused of that in the press in the early years. He was perceived as being a madman, a crazy man, a, probably a... A, a, a mad scientist creating in that kind of vein um, and shut in behind black doors and black draperies. I think some of his information did leak out that he loved weaponry. Um, he had a vast collection of um, ancient weaponry and suits of armor and was fascinated by all of that. that that's a very small group of people, which leads most people to think that you're a little crazy. Weapons, torture devices. That was part of his homework to make these characters come to life, is he had to really know what he was drawing. So all of that said, inside there's really this wonderful man with a great little tricky sense of humor. Loved pranks, loved children perceived that he hated children. If you look at his drawings, he loved children. He never would have bothered to draw them. He would have drawn them being tortured if he hated them. He drew them doing what he loved, 
which was to be a child. Um, he reveled in all of that right, right to the end. The archive of work that was left behind has a timelessness to it that really was quite surprising. Um, there are some, some of his drawings which have specific dates attached to them that have to do with events that happen in history. Um, however, his drawings seem to reflect nothing has changed. It just seems as though we are still doing exactly what we did centuries before. The Adams family is wonderful, but that has the, he had a lot of other parallel subjects going on, and one of them was relationships. And I think for a man who had a couple of questionable marriages, and then the last marriage was really quite wonderful, um, he knew a lot about relationships and a lot about trying to get rid of the, the other person and move along. Um, and that's wonderful. Um, children still misbehave. Children still try and get away with things. He observed it in the 30s and 40s and the 50s and 60s, and we're still doing the same thing today. His craft happens to be so wonderful that that also is timeless, that the cartoon face may have changed. We may have cartoonists today who are drawing who we are in society today. Charlie's drawings seem to still be there. So I don't think that's changed much, and I think you'd be very happy to know that, that his observations are still just as alive as they were when they were first drawn. And that's probably why the Adams family, in its, you know, coming up on, uh, you know, 45 years later, uh, or 40 years later, are still just as much fun as they were back when they were first created.